Argentina. Um, this is basically the map of Argentina. Let's see. You fly into Buenos Aires, the capital, and then we flew up to Tucumán and drove around this area, really. Close up, Tucumán. Uh, Salta is the center of the wine industry up there. Most of it's down in Mendocino. I'm actually going there next month. I have a nephew living there. But th there are more wine, um, more wine produced up in Salta. We then went up through uh, the Andes and down into the valleys, into the Chaco. The can you hear me? Okay, into the farmlands and into the foothills. And Huhui is another town that we went through and eventually flew from. And then we went at the end up into La Quiaca, which is right on the border with Bolivia. And the people all look Bolivian. You know, they look right out of um, Sundance Cassidy and Butch Cassidy and all of that. It's quite funny. Okay, we arrived in Buenos Aires in the morning. But our next flight wasn't till the following day. So the guide took us to the one of the local parks, Conserra Sur. And outside was this magnificent fountain, which wasn't squirting. And all of the gates have these wonderful sculptures. But as you can see, it's enclosed in plastic because many of the sculptures had been um, harvested, shall we say. It was sad. Uh, basically, it's a long, skinny park with a lake in the middle. I'm standing on the edge. Behind me, there's a, a pathway, then grass and trees, and then the road, and beyond that, apartment buildings with a view across. The other side, there's a path that we will go down, and beyond that, I think there was some kind of sort of foresty jungle, but it hadn't been developed. Meanwhile, here is this splendid contraption harvesting the water lilies, which were pretty thick everywhere. One of the first birds we saw were these magnificent swans, these black neck swans, just gorgeous. And another swan, a Coscaroba swan. Wattle Jacana, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, Florida or Costa Rica or Brazil or wherever. You see the Water lilies are pretty thick. Uh, common gallinule, which we get here in Connecticut every now and again. And rosy bill chard. Male. I mean, isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> Just gorgeous. Uh, white tufted grebe, which is very similar to our horned grebe. This, by the way, is mid early to mid-December. So that's like May. It's coming up into high summer and breeding. It's not that hot yet. Next month will be. Rufescent tiger heron. These names are so absolutely wonderful. You know, if they're going to change all our birds that have a person's name, they're going to have a hard time coming up with descriptions fitting these birds that haven't already been taken. So rufescent tiger heron. Again, I've seen those in various places. And a whistling heron. Oh dear, his head is cut off. Well, it wasn't in the original, but 
the point of this rather out of focus bird is that he's got wonderful colors. His bill is pink and black. He's got a lovely naked blue eye, a mustard colored patch on his ear, and then a yellow neck and a green neck, and down at the bottom, green pantaloons. Lovely bird. Ah, uh, this is an interesting one. These birds are parasites, obligate brood parasites is the term. It looks like an ordinary duck. It looks like a black duck, but it's a black-headed duck. And while we have birds here that use other birds' nests, wood duck, common mergansers, hooded mergansers, all nest in each other's boxes. Um, I think it's a matter of they look after each other, but also, you know, if you're flying home and you can't find your box, you see another box and you go and you lay your egg and carry on. This bird, no, she lays her eggs and takes off like our cowbirds. But I think that's kind of unique in the duck world. Uh, Southern Screamer. It's a perky-sized bird, and they're actually nesting on this bank here. I remember in Brazil being woken up, and I'm going to do this to you whether you like it or not, being woken up at five o'clock in the morning with these southern screamers flying by. We did not hear them, but, and Dave, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is what they did. Oh, 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 etc. <laughs> did you hear that? No. <laughs> I mean, did you hear them? Yes. Ah. <laughs> that was. <laughs> oh, well, this was 1992, so before you were born. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that was the male or the female, but he had a bit of a crest. This one doesn't. And there's a baby over there. Well, there is. You see it? There he is. A little baby. There were two babies, actually. There were turtles on the bank. Another wattle jacana. And then we were walking down the path on the other side, and here's this chap, female rather. She's laying her eggs. And then we met this. I don't know what kind of a lizard it is. I've just called it roadside. That was about four feet long. But look at this. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, look at yeah. that pattern. I mean, <laughs> isn't that unbelievably incredible? I wouldn't like to meet him on a dark night, though. Uh, Hannah lilies. Uh, at the bottom end of this pond, there was an area about 30 or 40 feet by another 20 or 30. It was just these solid yellow. I don't know what they were. So I put my app, picture this, and it said, the canna lilies. So again, if anybody can uh, contradict me, please feel free. But they were absolutely beautiful. And morning glories growing wild, really big ones. Jacaranda, not native, but quite common, very beautiful. And then this is a transition, transi transition from Buenos Aires to up in the north in uh, Tucumán. I'm not sure which morning this was. It might have been the first morning up there, but waking up and seeing this view with a touch of snow on the top of the mountains, it's just breathtaking. Okay. Driving across the first day we went up into the very high um, altipano, and this was fairly typical of what we saw. It's very flat with not much vegetation, a lot of dry grasses, and these farms with always with trees and fences and no animals. And I don't know what they do for food, but they don't appear to be growing potatoes, which you'd think they would, and cabbages or whatever, but there they are. And then again, in the distance, you've got the mountains with the snow on the top. This was very typical of what we drove through. I took a lot of pictures just through the window. And we did find herds of vicunia. I can't pronounce that properly. They are the most gorgeous animals. I mean, you really want to have one as a pet. They're beautiful. 
we drove through some very interesting uh, geology. Uh, I don't know if this is this is ferrous, this is iron, but the background there's a green, and it's green rock. It's I mean there is vegetation, but the rock is that color. I'm sure you know the Andes are the youngest mountain ranges in the world. And they're still upheaving, apparently, all the time. We didn't have any earthquakes or anything. But um, all of these things are very new. This, believe it or not, is an ancient stone circle. Apparently, the people who were here before the Incas arrived, that's before about AD 1000, built these stone circles. Modern man has taken the stones to build his house when he got tired of mud bricks. So it's hard to tell. And I wasn't tall enough to be able to look down, but there is a circle around there and a lot of debris in the middle. And apparently there were several of these. <laughs> this is a very typical picture of the group staring at a hillside where there is apparently a bird. I don't know what it was in this instance, but... We did a lot of looking at scrub like this, waiting for something to move, because everything is very well camouflaged. <laughs> and you notice there's one chap looking in the other direction, and I'm off to the side doing the same thing. Another typical farmhouse, but close up. Um, very neat, nice, very even mud bricks, uh, thatching on the roof, um, beautiful wall being built. And then look. Look, solar panel, requisite tree, and I'm standing on the road, and behind me, across the road, is their, their farm fields, their um, corrals. There were no cattle there, and there were probably cattle up in the hillside. There were cattle everywhere, but this is where they, where they uh, corral them. And we saw quite a lot of these stone uh, pastures. Couldn't resist this. Again, a solar panel. One, one window in the one room hut, but he has a solar panel. He's probably got television in there too. Oh, surely, surely. Um, we stayed in some very nice hotels. This is in Cafayate, which again is where they were uh, growing the, the grapes, a lot of vineyards. We didn't stop, unfortunately. We kept barreling through. It was very interesting. Everywhere we went, any shops we went into, any co coffee shops, cafes, they always had wine on hand. And they were selling the bottles or you could buy a glass. And then another hotel we stayed in, this was a kind of rustic one, Rincón de Fuego, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but I think that means corner of fire. And I have to explain, this is Mario, who was our local guide, and he was totally amazing. I fell absolutely totally in love with him. He knew everything and everywhere. I mean, this is his thing. He works out of Salta. And he was an absolute gentleman. On this trip, as you saw in that picture just now, there were seven men, one other woman. Originally, we were six and me, and then this other couple joined us at the last minute. And we were in this bus. And I got a gammy knee, and I couldn't get down out of this bus. It was just too high. I could get into it by hauling myself up, but I couldn't get down. So Mario, every single time, comes up and offers me his arm, his hand. It was just lovely. <laughs> so nice to be treated. I'm sorry? <laughs> what? <laughs> But he was a he was a brilliant guide too. I mean, he he just knew everything. But yeah, lovely chap. And then this is the inside. This is my room. Uh, very simple, very plain, clean, good plumbing. Everything worked. Uh, there was a little courtyard outside. Uh, it was just very pleasant. And I think this was the town that we were in when Argentina won the World Cup. The whole place was. Just screaming. I, I, it was totally wild. I mean, were they happy or what? Uh, waking up another morning and looking out of the window again, mountains with a touch of snow on the top. Not too shabby. 
And then I'd been asked to take pictures of gardens. Well, Argentine doesn't do gardens, as far as I can see. I did not find any that I would consider as a mad gardener a garden. This was one of the few elegant houses that we saw alongside the road. And we did see others. Fairly typical, a lawn. And I get this point of working. Palm trees, uh, shrubs, uh, probably a citrus, outdoor dining room with a barbecue pit, and possibly some roses somewhere. But uh, no flowers. Nice fence, nice stone wall, never any flowers. But I tell a bit of a lie because here we were going up a really narrow valley with a roaring torrent down on the left. We were looking, of course, for dippers, which we did find, but I didn't photograph. And there's this house, which is pretty neat and tidy and pretty. And it's got hydrangeas and roses and lilies, and it's all lovely. And then next door is the dump from hell. <laughs> it was really funny. And this was another house we stumbled upon with a nice garden. Again, these incredible hydrangeas. And this is way up in the mountains, miles from anywhere, no other houses around. Hydrangeas and red hot pokers, and I think that is a house. There were a couple of dogs that made very friendly, having growled and then established that we weren't harming them. But I think I think that's the house there. We saw so many of those. Now this might have been planted by this house, but we saw them just everywhere, just growing wild. And while these are in somebody's garden, uh, we did see them growing wild up in the hills too. And again, um, my app says it's a belladonna. This orange cestrum was also growing in the wild and attracted hummingbirds. Foxgloves, this was oh, way up above the tree line. There was a house and a hillside, and the hillside was covered with these foxgloves. <laughs> And a cactus in the background. Now, these are the same foxgloves we have here. Whether they had been planted or accidentally spread, I don't know, but it was just kind of strange. And Bolivian begonia, which we know as angel wings. There they're growing on a rock face. And this, of course, I couldn't resist. It's called bird of paradise. It says Alpinia gillesii. How would you pronounce that? And there it is, close up. Just a beautiful shrub. Now, this is an enigma. This is a farm with cattle in fields, not in this one, but in either side of the road in absolutely baked brick like this. The ground, there was nothing growing but this. And I thought it was some kind of a voodoo plant, Arisema. But my app says it's um, skunk cabbage. Now, to my knowledge, skunk cabbage grows in swamps. Uh, ain't no water there, but yeah, that's what, open. that's, well, yes, it's, it's that family. Open. But my app says it's a skunk cabbage, so there. Arum. It's some kind of an arum, yeah. But in bone, bone dry. Cactus is growing up the hillside. And here, this is in the middle of the town. Can you see this chap standing here? He's six foot. I mean, <laughs> it's off the page. This was a grocery or deli or something, little shop, people popping in and out. I forget which town. Uh, quite a lot of epiphytes. And here we stopped for lunch with this wonderful view. We had lunch from the bus every day, and it was the same lunch every day. Bread and bologna and cheese and bread and bologna and cheese. And I tell you, you do not go to this part of Argentina looking for food. I don't think we had a decent meal the whole time we were there. I mean, it was just, the meat was tough. And then there was potatoes and carrots and salad. It was, yes, but it was, no. <laughs> Oh, I, I hope the good lady who organized this tour isn't listening. I think she said she was going to, but they went on holiday instead. 
By the way, this whole tour was, was organized by Gina Nichol, Sunrise Birding. And I'm sure you many of you have heard her talk because she's come here and given travelogues. And you've been on her tours, perhaps. I know I've been on several and always beautifully run. Everything is just great, but the food wasn't. <laughs> and that wasn't her fault. <laughs> anyway, this is our, our guide, uh, Eduardo Patrial. Apparently, he's quite well known. He's from Brazil, from Rio. And he has uh, toured all over the place. He'd never been here before, but he's one of those incredible people who sees a bird once, hears it chip, and it's there in his brain forever. And even if he hasn't seen it, if he's seen it in a book, he knew everything. Absolutely extraordinary brain. Amazing man. And then here's my friend with his head cut off. Uh, Mario again, and our driver, Carlos. And the reason this picture is here is Mario is drinking mate. I don't know. I didn't know this, but apparently it's the sort of national drink of Argentina. It's a sort of a tea made from leaves of something or other. And you normally drink it in a dried out gourd with a silver straw, which apparently kills all the bugs. I don't understand chemistry, but um, he is actually drinking, I think, from um, a ceramic one. I'm not sure. Anyway, these guys all drank it all the time, and they handed it back and forth. We were not offered some, which is strange, because it's supposed to be the great thing of friendship, you know, like passing the peace pipe. But we were not offered some. Um, there he is. And there was, there was one on the console in the, in the van, which was definitely not made of, well, it's not a gourd. I think it was ceramic. We went into several national parks. Oh, rats. That is a huge frog. That's been cut off by that silly green sign. I must remember this in future. Do not put anything on the top. I think if we'd ever met one of those frogs, we'd have turned and run. I mean, it was a fearsome looking creature. What we did see, though, was in front of another headquarters in another park, these magnificent sculptures made out of bits of cars that had obviously met a sorry end. This, of course, is an iguana. And a puma and a giant anteater. And there were several others, but it's so clever. And then we went up one day 12,000 feet. And none of us had any altitude sickness, which is strange. I guess we were just too keen to go birding. It's way above the tree line. It's barren rocks, there's scrub, there's a little bit of brush, a lot of rocks, and in between some of these rocks are these little plants. It's prickly, and I don't know what it is. Uh, picture this doesn't know at all. I don't think it's a cactus. It might be a fern with spikes. I don't know. Anyway, it had these gorgeous flowers, and we sat and waited, and sooner or later, ta-da! Andean hill star, this is the female. She is uh, about five or six inches long. Her wings are as long as her tail. And she kept flying in, sipping, and then going out again. So we just sort of sat there with a finger on the button. The male, unfortunately, never came. He has a white belly with a bright red stripe down it. But she is so camouflaged. A couple of times we were waiting, and somebody said, but she's there. She snuck in. This huge bird. We did see giant, giant uh, hummingbirds as well, but she was big and, and totally camouflaged. And the other hummingbird that we saw a great deal of, the red-tailed comet, uh, he's about six inches long, including that tail. Female doesn't have the tail, but she has a lot of those other gorgeous colors. We saw those. They were always on the move. They never sat still. This one is sitting still but the wind is blowing very hard, so it's buffeting it. So that's why it's, you know, a bit fuzzy. Sorry about that. The wind did it. But they're just the prettiest little things. We saw quite a few other hummingbirds, but I was no good with the shutter. A buff-necked ibis. This is a bird that I think of as, you know, a water bird. But here we are up in the high mountains, 
Uh, this is a bare cliff behind. Yes, there's a, a, an acacia tree or something in the foreground. We also saw them out in fields, dry fields, foraging. Buffnick ibis is quite a handsome bird. And then we stopped in front of this. It's sandstone. That color is extraordinary. And it's covered with holes. And I promised you burrowing owls and burrowing parrots. Well, this is where the parrots burrow. And on that cliff face somewhere is this one. The coloring is a bit enigmatic, but there's some pretty colors in there, that teal on the wing and red pantaloons. And then a little bit further on, we had a huge flock of them flying around, and they landed in a tree. <laughs> Burrowing parrots. Oh. Yeah. That white eye is very distinct. We saw mite of parrots. I just stuck these two together just for fun. Their facial markings are a little different. And you all know this monk parakeet, such as we have here in Connecticut. We saw them not actually nesting, but we saw their nests in big trees with hundreds of nests in them. That's the same bird we have here. And a gray hooded parakeet, which is only up in these, in this part of the world. Oh, there were a lot of other parrots too, big flocks of them. This was an interesting one. It's a tiny little bird. It's only about five or six inches long. And it lives above the tree line. There's grass there and just rocks above it. Uh, one or two of these shrubs along the road. And we're going along looking for them. And suddenly a chap in the back of the bus says, Parrots! Driver slams on the brakes and we back up. And there they are in this bush. They're so well camouflaged that the guides didn't see them. The back in the back of the bus did. Now, they look pretty bright green. These ones are sitting up. Others would sort of tuck down in. There are quite a few of them there, but really hard to see. Bright, bright green, pretty little things. Okay, enough parrots. Um, we did not see a lot of doves or pigeons or anything, but these were right beside the road, totally camouflaged. Again, until they moved, you really couldn't see them. They've got uh, orange, bare orange skin around their eyes, bare-faced ground doves. Oh, this was rather fun. I suddenly realized I could do this. We came up this, we came up this road here, past this hotel, over this bridge, and up this road here. And I'm standing here, obviously taking this photo. We went along a lot of deep gorges like this. There's just a trickle of water there at the moment, but you can see that it obviously could be pretty serious. <clears throat> wonderful clouds everywhere. I, I've noticed in these photos that the clouds are always quite interesting. Mountain Lake, there were ducks there. Quite a lot of lakes up there in these otherwise barren areas. This was rather interesting. This we stopped. We were told that there were some lakes. A Pozuelo, according to my dictionary, is a well, but I think that's a loose translation. Probably means ponds or puddles or lakes or something. Because we came around the corner, we walked about a mile or two across that uh, sandy scrub, and we came across the lake. And <laughs> here are the flamingos, as promised. There are three kinds there: Chilean. Oh, gone! It's off the page. I'm so sorry. Well. Nothing we can do about that. Anyway, um, the way to tell these different birds apart is the Chileans have pink knees, red knees. I think that's three in a not quite adult. And then the one in the background up here is an Andean in non-breeding plumage. And he's got, he's got yellow legs. And talking of yellow legs, this little chap down here is a lesser yellow legs as seen in Connecticut. Think of that, he goes all the way from the high Andes up to Connecticut. I mean, how about that? And here's two more Chileans. Now, these are in breeding plumage. They're bright, bright colors. 
And here, for contrast, is three Chilean, Chilean with their red knobby knees and a breeding plumage Andean with its yellowish legs. And look at this up in the corner. That's a giant coot. Look at the size of it. Nearly as big as a large um, flamingo. And then this is the third one, a James's. Uh, this is non-breeding plumage, but he's a paler bird and he's got pink legs. So that's how you tell them apart. Red knees, yellow legs, and pink legs. And here's a couple of Andeans. And you can always tell these because they have these black wingtips. And do any of you, I'm sure you don't, but I confess to doing so, watch uh, Bachelor in Paradise? Oh. Have you noticed that guys are all, you know, guys, and the girls wear little bits of string up here and little bits of string down there? So this being on CBS or ABC or NBC, I forget which it is, so there is this modesty factor that broadcasters must adhere to. So on the program, every time these girls turn their backs to you, they put these black patches over them. <laughs> so here we have these flamingos, similarly censored. I just <laughs> when I'm looking through the thick pictures and I come up with this one, I say, oh my God, did I really take that? It is not Photoshop, truly. That is, that is the real thing. <laughs> And here's a couple Redaction. of stars. The back one is much bigger. I think they're probably not both Chilean, but never mind. And then on the next pond over, there were these spoonbills. Again, this is up at eight, ten thousand 10,000 feet. And these are birds that you see down in the Florida swamps and marshes. Extraordinarily lovely birds. I love this picture. I'm watching you. I didn't give you permission to photograph me. So I'll just stretch. Look at the colors on those. I mean, mm, aren't they delicious? And Andy and Goose, we never saw them except alone. We saw quite a few, but they never were with others. Strange beast. Have a set. Very handsome. Again, this is all in these high, high marshes. It's quite extraordinary. There were black neck stilts up there too. A puna deal. The puna is is the high desert by definition. Gorgeous looking bird. He is in breeding plumage with that blue beak. The female is similar. She just has a you know plain brown head and brown beak. She's like so many of these ducks. She's just drab. Cinnamon teal again, as seen in this country sometimes. Wonderful colors in the wing. And, oh, well, trust me, it's a yellow-billed teal. Recently, it was called a speckled teal. And my book, which is two years old, calls it a speckled teal. But we saw a few of those. They're rather cute. And then nearby was this one, which my book says is an Inca teal. But no, it's been... Uh, described now as a subspecies of the yellow-billed, a.k.a. speckled. They are vaguely similar, but this one has a distinctly dark head, whereas the other one had a dark mantle as well. These did not. But they're so compact and neat and clean. They're just pretty little birds, aren't they? A uh, giant coot with babies. Face only a mother could love. And the southern lap. I mean, isn't this another absolutely gorgeous bird? Look at look at the colors again. It's got this pink and black bill, which I'm trying to highlight. No, anyway, trust me. It's got a pink and black bill, black forehead, red eye, a bit of a bit of a whisker that's lying on its back, a, a, a crest, uh, mustard on the wing, and teal and black and white. And look at those legs. I mean, isn't he gorgeous? I'm using that word a lot. Sorry about that. Uh, torrent ducks. We found them on this raging torrent. And they were popping in and out, in and out, mostly in. 
if you or I had fallen in that river, we'd have been dead in seconds. But he and his mate and two babies were just jumping in and out, absolutely unharmed. The, the female is quite different from the male. She's, you can see she's got chestnut flanks. Her whole belly and whole tummy is uh, that wonderful chestnut color with the red bill. They were fascinating to watch. Anyone know what this is? I couldn't identify it. Come on, guys. <laughs> no, it's just a good old turkey vulture. Same old turkey vulture. But he's got some interesting color in his tail. Look at that. And this is the condor. And we saw quite a lot of those flying high. They very, very rarely came down close enough for me to get a picture of, unfortunately. And they never were below us, so that was out of the question. But there were a lot of them. Oh, bother. I really goofed on this. I'm so sorry. I'd forgotten about these things at the top of the picture. Uh, mountain Caracara. <clears throat> mean looking devil with a really beady eye. I mean, they're scavengers like other Caracaras, live and dead. But they were nesting there on this vertical cliff with this nice ledge. There are two chicks there, the parent and two chicks. And apparently they've been using this nest for a while. Another Karakara, which most commonly I've seen down in, in the farmland near habit human habitation. But here he is. Well, you can see how high he's soaring. And they're a brown bird. There's their nest. There's one on the nest there, the second nest below. And here's one close up. I must explain that. We had a 10-hour layover at Buenos Aires Airport, and we were in the outer vestibule. They wouldn't let us into the airport until our plane was called. And this bird kept landing on this buttress, whatever it was. And finally, I got up and took a picture. The color is, of course, because of the glass keeping out the sun and the heat. That is otherwise a brown bird, the mango. They all are, yes. Uh, Harris's hawk with a white tip to his tail. We saw a lot of different hawks. There's one called variable. And the back of my mind is thinking, could this really be a variable? Because they were all different. We, every time we saw one, we said, what's that bird? It's different. And the guide would say through gritted teeth, it's a variable. <laughs> a younger squan. The youngus is the... Uh, lower forest, below the rainforest, but above the charcoal. And it's about the size of a female turkey. Quite a handsome bird. Huku toucans. And this actually was in somebody's garden. We were peering through the fence looking for a bird we hoped to see. And the farmer came out and said, would you like to come up into my place? I've got ponds with ducks on them. So we said, yes, please. He took us in, and that's when I saw these toko toucans. They were a pair. They were talking to each other, clacking their bills, and then flying around in formation and landing again. So this chap lived in this elegant farmhouse, which he's going to turn into a hotel. He showed us inside, and <laughs> despite the elegant exterior, the rooms inside were kind of small, and plain and bare. It was really very strange. But he had a garden. Uh, hydrangeas, uh, agapanthus, palm trees, uh, flowering bush over here. And the other, looking down the hill, um, he had palm trees that he had imported from southern Argentina, these palm trees up here. Uh, never mind. One's in the top, top left. Um, huge palm trees, and behind, just below it, there's an elephant's ear. He'd had all these brought in from another part of the country to see if they would work in his garden. There were also cattle wandering around. This is the bird we were looking for, a black-legged seriema. It's basically a terrestrial bird. It doesn't fly unless it has to, so we just saw it walking along the ground. That was a, one that we really hoped to find and didn't think we necessarily would. Is that I'm sorry? I believe it is, yes, yes. There's also a red leg. 
which is more common. Ah, this is one of the most common birds anywhere, Rufus hornero, uh, the oven bird. It builds a mud oven nest. It's about oh, six or eight inches high and round, and it builds them on any flat surface. I've seen them you know, on, on branches of trees, on lampposts, on walls, on anything, ma mailboxes. And there's a sort of a small hole that they go into, and there's an outer chamber and a little passage that tucks around into the actual nesting area at the back. And we saw a lot of those. They're very often on the ground. Roof Sonero. And this fellow was totally camouflaged. We're tooling along in the bus, and suddenly, because he's near the road, he gets up and runs. The Andean Tinamu with a rather elegant crest and a quite sharply decurved beak, orange beak, but totally camouflaged, as you can see, against the rocks there. Mm -hmm. Borrowing out. This is one of my most favorite birds ever. I just love them. They stare at you, daring you to come near their nest. He's saying, I'll make mincemeat of you if you step a moment closer. Just a beautiful bird. Golden-breasted woodpecker. We didn't see a lot of woodpeckers, despite all the trees, but a few. And forktail flycatcher, doing his thing. Okay, we saw a bunch of different finches. This is a brush finch, a fulvous-headed brush finch, and he seems to be camouflaged with the fruit. But isn't his face wonderful? That expression. And it's not just by chance, because here's another one with the same <laughs> inquisitive look. How dare you come here? But again, camouflage, which is rather extraordinary. So that's a brush finch. This is a charcoal finch. The charcoal is the lowland farmland. And we saw a lot of these many-colored charcoal finches, rather handsome. He's almost identical with a, um, a gross beak. Very subtle differences, but this is the finch. Excuse me, charcoal finch. And then there are Sierra finches. This, um, from way up in the stony ground, is a gray hooded Sierra finch, a black hooded Sierra finch, a morning Sierra finch, and then there are warbling finches. <clears throat> Rusty brown warbling finches. He's rather handsome, isn't he? And common chlorosphingus, which is also known as a common bush tanager. Take your pick. A white tipped plant cutter. Again, he's kind of camouflaged in there. I don't know if that's pure dance or whether the birds think about it. <laughs> this is the male. The female is uh, just gray. And this little fellow, this little fellow is four inches. I mean, he's tiny, a yellow-billed tip tyrant. And look at that expression, daring you to come. You know, talk about attitude. Look at him, his nice little crest and that very beady eye. I don't think that's a very yellow bill, but never mind, he does. <laughs> And sorry about the focus on this. I couldn't resist it. It looks so like a chipping sparrow, but it's a marsh sparrow. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether Day, uh, Ray is watching, but this reminds me of him. The Oh, bother, the sign's gone, isn't it? It's a rufous-collared sparrow. I'm sure some of you remember going on Dave's trips. Years ago, he had a, a tour company called... Zonotrichia capensis. I think that was a Zonotrichia cause after this bird, Zonotrichia capensis. And every time I see one of those, I think of Ray. It's a bird. Yeah. And that's the end of the sparrows out in the grassland. And look at those clouds. I think there's mountains behind them with snow <laughs> on them, probably. Anyway, a lot of very barren ground like this. And we came out here looking for movement. Again, watch for movement, because if it doesn't move, you won't see it. What are we looking for? Seed snipes. 
Again, this is, you know, 10,000 feet or so. And there he was. And until he moved, he was so well camouflaged. If he's hunkered down, you don't see that belly. All you see is the gray, gray-breasted seed snipe. And a lesser rare, also in this scrubby ground. And I can tell you this is a male. And how do I know it's a male? Nothing to do with the white in its tail or anything like that. He's got the babies. <laughs> we, at the time, counted about 15. I can't count 15 there now, but that was his troop. And how do I know it's a male? Because the female apparently lays her eggs, incubates, and as soon as they open their eyes, and these are precocial, they get out of the shell, they shake themselves off, and they immediately get up and start running around looking for food, and mom takes off. <laughs> Dad stays and looks after them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay, that's it for the birds. Now we're into the vicuñas, which you, we saw in quite large herds on those wide open spaces. I'm surprised there were none in that previous picture, but there weren't. And they were usually in the distance, but smaller groups were often by the road. And they are just the most lovely creatures. Cuddly. I mean, wouldn't you like that as a pet? Or this one? That sucking on the straw. I mean, aren't they totally delicious? And here's another picture just for fun. I mean, I could throw 50 more, but I won't. And then there are the llamas. I bet none of you knew that a llama is not a natural animal. The Incas apparently bred them back in 10,000 or something like that, crossing alpacas and guanacos, and they came up with this. And they're farmed. There are no wild ones. If you meet one on its own, it's a state. They're totally farmed. You can see there's fencing in the background. They're raised for their coats, for their fur, their wool, and for meat. Tough, tough, tough. Not very good. But the locals eat them and the tourists get fed them, but I don't know. <laughs> and look at this chap. I mean, talk about poise, attitude. He's the most scruffy creature you've ever seen in your life, but he is so proud, so upright. Of course, he's about to molt, at least we hope he's about to molt because it's about to be summer. I don't know if that's a young one or a small one, but uh, isn't he just delicious? Yeah. And then you get one like this. I mean, they all have these little ear tags because uh, they're all owned by different farmers in different fields, and sometimes I suppose they mix. But that long, long neck, why? I mean, they're camels, the camelids. They're all of these four are basically South American camels and an Andean goose in the foreground. Why did the cow climb up the hill? <laughs> I mean... This is not photoshopped or anything. This is this is this is how it was. And I don't know what he saw when he got to the other side. But this is up where that little uh, hill star hummingbird was. Absolutely barren landscape, but there was a huge herd of cows there. Just grazing on straw, roughly speaking, twelve thousand feet. And this little chap quite close by. <laughs> And here's another story. We came to this farm and we wanted to go up this farm track for whatever reason. Got permission from the farmer and started out. And after about a mile, my knee said, that's enough. So I said, okay, I'm going to go back to the bus. And I walked back on my own, had some nice birding. And I got back to the farm and the cows are coming from the field on the right and going into the field on the left, cows and calves, except one of them wasn't cow. And he broke away from the pack and he started walking very seriously towards me. So I stopped and he kept walking and I thought, what the God am I going to do? What the dickens am I going to do? Anyway, he finally stopped and we stared at each other and I'm practically peeing in my pants. I mean, what do you do if a bull charges you? You know, you can't climb a tree because there are no trees. Uh, finally, he got bored and turned around and went back to his harem. But that was, um, that was a pretty scary moment. 
there were goats, quite a lot of goats up in the mountains, just climbing on these sheer rock faces. I love goats. I'm coming back as a goat in my next life. And just wandering along the road, there were pigs and piglets. And mules, he's got his feet hobbled. Apparently, this is what they do. Um, I don't know where the farmer was. This was miles from anywhere up, up in the mountains and no sign of anybody. But apparently, they bring them up there. And rather than tying them to a tree, they hobble their feet so they can't go anywhere. Yeah. Apparently, it's, it's very common in other parts of the world. I don't know. I've not seen it. And this little rodent, it's uh, like a, a hair, about the size of a hair, a viscacha. It's a rabbit family, and totally camouflaged again until it moved. You couldn't see it. Rather cute, though. We didn't see very many butterflies, and this is a couple. Was this beetle? I mean, wouldn't you love that as a brooch? No? <laughs> Quite extraordinary. And on that leaf, too. <clears throat> Uh, owling one night, we, we we found this in the road. Not what you want to meet on a dark night. John, is that a tarantula? Wolf spider. Wolf spider. Wolf spider. Mm. Oh, has it got oh, those babies on its back? Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Russ. Okay, I wondered what that was that looked all sort of pop. Those are its babies on its back. Wow. Goodness gracious. Like the yeah, a wolf spider. <laughs> Heavens. Well, she would probably bite first and ask second who you are. Yeah. Okay, I didn't take many pictures of people. I don't like to intrude on them. And so I'm taking this through the bus window, hoping nobody's watching. Well, the woman on the left clearly sees that I am taking <laughs> photos. <laughs> Look at the dog. And these people all look Bolivian. I mean, they're right out of Butch Cassidy sort of thing. Uh, this is right on the corner of Bolivia. There's a river that divides this town and, and Bolivia. And many of them wear the, wearing the typical hats. We didn't see much in the way of what you might say typical native dress, but the faces, <clears throat> like this one here, And this was uh, an ultimate hotel, uh, Posada Pita in Yavi, Kuhui province. Uh, it's a little village of about 20 houses with no shops or anything. And we pull up to this and, okay, this is our hotel. All right, okay. And this is the entrance at the side. And it was explained very quickly that this was indeed a 200-year-old building on the left with a thatch roof, and the rest of it is new-built to match. Inside, the rooms were very nice, very comfortable. We had electric banquets and fires in December there, which is May. Up in the mountains, it was cold. Uh, new bathrooms, beautiful all plumbing work, everything. It was lovely, really lovely. We had breakfast there, but not a dinner. And this is the courtyard between two rows of cottages. This is four of the people on the trip. The guy on the left was a Dutchman. Uh, the next one is from Texas or Silicon Valley. I'm not sure. He was a, one of those geniuses anyway. Uh, the guy in red is from Boston. And the guy nearest me now is from Cornwall, England. The other couple had to stay somewhere else, and they were from also from England. And a chap from Ohio had gone home, and there was somebody else. I don't know where, where he went. This is the morning we're leaving. And we had arrived in the late afternoon and gone straight out to a scrubby bank to look for a hummingbird. The hummingbird is basically a Bolivian. It's not... Argentinian, but they don't know the border, and they come across in this one place, a nest in this one place. And we sat there in the evening, and they didn't come. Apparently, they had just arrived, but not the females. They come a few days later. So next morning, we get up, 
at first light, and we go and sit by this scrubby bush, and eventually this chap shows up, and then another. And they're sitting on these thorns on either side of a bush, and they chatter at each other, and every now and again they get up and fly around and show off, this is my bush, no, it's my bush. They never fought, they never interacted, and as I say, the females haven't arrived yet anyway. But isn't he unbelievably gorgeous? Now, how would you describe him? Wedge-tailed hill star? I mean, there's got to be something better. Just an amazing bird. This was, you know, I think if the guide, the guide, if we hadn't seen this bird, he would have burst into tears because he was so anticipating it, the, ch the Brazilian chap. And every slideshow ends with a sunset, but because the sun sets behind the mountains, I have to give you a dawn. This is actually, <laughs> this is uh, uh, Sierra Aconcagua. I don't think I'm pronouncing it. Aconcagua, which is the highest peak in Argentina and I think the Andes at 22,831 when they last measured it. As I say, they're still rising. And that, as they say, is that.